So awesome, we are live. Hi, Tore. Welcome to the ASIT podcast. Hi, Manuel. Um, I'm just going to start off with a short introduction on you. You are currently a research group leader at Google DeepMind and hold a part-time position at the Chair of Machine Learning at University College London. And on top, you also serve as a member of the Board of Directors at the Partnership on AI. And before coming to DeepMind, you did a lot of interesting work at Microsoft that we can maybe also talk about a little bit. They're developing, for example, the True Skill system, which ranks players in multiplayer games. And you were also involved in research predicting personality traits from Facebook data that actually caused quite the stir in the media and even made it into the Colbert report. So that was kind of cool. <laughs> and after Microsoft, you came to DeepMind and were part of something which I think can uncontroversially called one of the coolest projects in the history of AI, namely the development of AlphaGo, which I assume most of our listeners have actually already heard about. And this probably culminated in the match of AlphaGo against Lee Sedol in 2016 that was covered also in media all over the globe and actually watched live by more than 100 million people at some point and also had a great documentary made about it that's now on Netflix and YouTube. And you are also doing very interesting work on multi-agent learning, investigating, for example, sequential social dilemmas with deep reinforcement learning. So obviously there's a lot of things we could talk about even without getting into music theory and our other shared interests. <laughs> so, right. but I thought before we go into any of the details, we could um, start maybe with the basics. Last time we talked to you, you asked me what intelligence is. So I think I'm just going to throw that ball back to you and ask you what what is intelligence? Right, yeah, let's start with the really easy questions here, right? And we'll ramp it up later. <laughs> probably the, you know, probably the consciousness. <laughs> but uh, maybe we can skip the consciousness bit. Uh, intelligence is a little easier, I would say. So um, I, I won't talk about the specific uh, definition that I completely stand by, but um, I think this, the question is super interesting. If we do artificial intelligence, we had better got some notion about what intelligence is in general. And uh, I think in some sense, all we have to go by is inspiration from human intelligence. That's the highest form of intelligence, arguably, that uh, we can find in nature, uh, maybe um, at least in individuals or at least to the degree that we understand intelligence. And so that's uh, certainly a good starting point. And um, I quite liked uh, the way my colleague Shane Legg and uh, Marcus Hutter uh, characterized this in their work. Um, what they did is they went into the literature and all kinds of literature, not just technical literature, but you know, psychological literature and so on, um, encyclopedias, and they uh, collected all kinds of uh, definitions of what intelligence, uh, how people had defined intelligence, and tried to distill something out of that that could serve as a, as a good um, definition. And they basically came up with this idea that uh, intelligence measures the ability of an agent to succeed in a wide range of environments. And um, I quite like that. That has a lot of ingredients that I like. There's an agent. So intelligence in that definition only makes sense if there's an agent, some entity that's acting in the world. Um, there's the notion of success, so it's about completing certain tasks, solving certain problems. And of course, uh, that can't be done independently of some environment in which that happens. And it's that wide range of environments which gets at the idea of generality, uh, the idea that uh, a system for us to be considered intelligence need to be able to solve a wide range of problems and not just be designed to solve one very specific problem. And so I quite like that. And um, they go on to formalize this also mathematically, which uh, leads to, to a beautiful theory um, where they think of the agent as a reinforcement learning agent that interacts with an environment by observing the state of the environment and then sending actions to that environment and also receiving a reward from that environment. And in reinforcement learning, we then think of um, 
success or the goal to maximize long-term rewards in that setting. And this definition of intelligence that they propose is then the sum over um, all computable environments inversely weighted by their complexity of how much value an agent achieves in that environment. And uh, so it's a beautiful definition. I always put it up when I give talks and then I deviate from it because it's uh, uh, not directly uh, of practical use. But I think it does give a good idea of roughly what we're talking about when we say intelligence. Yeah, and I think it nicely incorporates actually two things you're working on, which the first one is games, which play a kind of also a red thread throughout your work, which occur on multiple stages and in multiple context and the other is the idea of the agent which is usually seen as kind of the cell of like the, the place where intelligence resides is the agent but you actually look taking a look at multi-agent learning a lot which is like the interesting phenomena that some kind of new intelligence can actually be created or take place in the interaction of, of multiple agents and that is actually a red thread that uh, something that reminded me actually on a couple of theories of cultural and and human evolution. I don't know if you know the work by Joe Henrik and Jared Diamond that actually um, put the cultural evolution of, of human beings, uh, a central ingredient to that was actually the interaction between a lot of strangers and like the, the density of people interacting with each other is actually what brought forth like uh, shared human intelligence. Yeah, very much so. Um, we talk a lot about that type of work uh, in the team as a motivation for multi-agent work. But uh, maybe getting to the games aspect first. I, I, I'm a huge fan of games. I like playing them myself. Um, but why would they be good for AI research? I think that's a great question. Certainly through the history of AI, they have played a big role. Uh, you can think of chess as maybe the Drosophila of uh, of AI research uh, at various stages of AI. Uh, people have looked at this von Neumann, Shannon, um, later the work by IBM that lead to, led to Deep Blue uh, and Kasparov. Um, so I think games are very special in that they are re often represent simplified versions of problems that we encounter in the real world. A typical game, for example, often has time in it, often represented by moves being taken, maybe turn taking. There's space in it. If you think about a board game, say chess or go, there's a spatial dimension to it. Things can be close together or further apart. They interact based on spatial relationships. Um, there's elements of chance, you know, dice enter, give an element of stochasticity, maybe similar to fate in real life. Uh, there's often the notion of resources, right? The, you know, you have to, you have a certain amount of resources and need to use them in a, in a way to achieve your goals. And ultimately, of course, what I like about them is they are multi-agent. Unless you uh, play solitaire, games have that idea of multi-agency automatically built in. Uh, and I think that makes them very compelling. And there's an extra bit, which is, They've been designed to engage human minds. That's the purpose of games. And if we think of the human mind as this proof of concept uh, that intelligence can exist, that there is such a thing as intelligent agents, then games having been designed to engage that intelligence make a, make a good test bed because um, without even us having to come up with problems, they are problems that have already been designed for the purpose of engaging intelligent beings or potentially intelligent machines uh, and, and letting them learn and reason and so on. So yeah, games, games are great. And if we can have them in a computer, then they're perfect for AI because then things are scalable and we can control them. You know, we have visibility of all aspects of the game and they're safe. You know, we don't have to, uh, you know, use human uh, beings for interaction. We can just simulate things within computers. And um, so they're, they're a great package. Yeah. And it's really something that captures the imagination of, of a lot of people, I think, as we... 
that's a great point as well. You're quite right. You know, if you compare, uh, if you did your research in some self-made kind of world or on some dry problem as compared to, to doing it uh, with a game that people know and play and love, uh, it's so much more engaging. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe quickly going back to uh, to uh, multi-agent learning systems. So um, you actually worked on these uh, yeah kind of uh, toy problems, I, I guess, that are part of game theory and that in involve this like interaction and like kind of the emergence of of things like cooperation and competition in in very simple agent systems. Can you quickly mention what what kind of things you did there and what you were looking at? Yeah, exactly. So uh, we were talking about board games and so on, but of course there is game theory which uh, tries to um, extract the essentials of of the idea of a game and, and study study those essentials. And um, in game theory, there's a particular type of problem uh, that we call the social dilemma. And it's a type of game uh, in which uh, agents have an incentive to act selfishly and take certain actions. But if they all do that and take the selfish action, then the collective outcome will be very bad. And you might recognize in that a lot of the problems that humanity is facing. For example, something like climate change, all kinds of um, uh, environmental issues, um, uh, aspects of inequality, um, you know, voting systems, they all uh, can suffer from these things. And uh, maybe the, the nicest um, story to just explain how this might play out in real life is the tragedy of the commons, where you uh, have, say, a collection of people who, who have some grazing ground available and want to have their cows graze on that grazing ground. And everything's fine as long as every single person only has one cow, because then it's a sustainable resource. But then, of course, if you put yourself into the shoes of any one of these participants of that particular game, of course, they would like to maybe have two or three or more cows to graze on that land. And there's no extra cost for them to do that other than putting that extra cow on top. But there's a cost to the community. And um, so individually, they want to do that. But if every single participant of this collective puts on additional cows, then the grazing ground uh, might be destroyed and they might all lose what they previously had or at the, at the beginning of, of the game had. We call that the tragedy of the commons. And it is found uh, everywhere across human societies. And that had been studied before uh, in game theory with game theoretic models. But what we uh, defined um, is a, a sequential version of that. We call them, in fact, sequential social dilemmas, which are games in which people don't make that decision instantaneously, for example, to cooperate and not put another, another cow or, um, or to, to put, put another cow, a cow uh, and defect from the, from the collective in that sense. Um, but instead, they do that in multiple steps. So we have these maps where you can, where the agents are actually little dots, and they can move around and do certain things. And um, so that allows us to study how this interaction of selfish agents in these social dilemmas plays, plays out over place and time, and hence adds these additional dimensions that make uh, the system much more realistic and allow us to uh, to study things that, that were previously impossible to study. Yeah, one very interesting aspect that you mentioned in one of your talks is actually that even the decision to cooperate, which is usually in these game theoretic, um, if you have these lookup tables and you can either cooperate and then you get a certain outcome, but in these sequential models, it's actually, if even if you decide to cooperate, then you need to develop a strategy that actually allows you to cooperate and that might sometimes be more difficult than the simple decision to do it, which is probably also a good explanation of why humans struggle so much with effectively <laughs> cooperating. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. So the, you, um, in, in reality, we don't just choose if we want to cooperate or defect. We need to implement it, 
we need to um, develop a strategy to do it. And that can very well influence which solution we end up with. I imagine that defecting was very easy to implement, whereas um, cooperating was very difficult. Under those circumstances, it's quite clear that defecting would be the policy that everyone would go to immediately. And we'd be in the middle of the social dilemma going down. Um, whereas if cooperation is easier, then of course people would be more likely to take that option. And so it also poses an interesting question of how to design collective systems. Because if we could design them in such a way that cooperation is easier naturally to arrive at than, um, than defection, then um, we, could, uh, we could encourage people in that way to cooperate more and get better collective outcomes. Also reminded me of I think the the whole issue with the vaccine distribution on the in the world and within countries also something that reminded me of these game theoretical consideration a lot because you have this prioritization but as soon as people start behaving ego egoistically then other people that hear about it also start implementing that policy and it exactly yeah so we've we've uh, taken this work um, and and uh, in some sense enlarged it in in its scope. Um, in a collaboration with Alan Duffo at the Future of Humanity Institute in Oxford, we've created a project that we um, call Cooperative AI. We ran a NeurIPS workshop on it last year. We uh, wrote a, a pretty big open um, problems paper where we outline the problems in cooperative AI. Because we think beyond uh, the specific example that we talked about, it is uh, necessary for us to think about AIs that have the capacity to cooperate. Um, just think about uh, AIs entering more and more parts of our lives, um, playing greater roles in, in science and technology, but also in you know, commerce, in politics, uh, in warfare for that matter. Um, in diplomacy maybe, how can we ensure that these future AI agents that will become more intelligent and also have greater autonomy in the future, that they are as good as cooperation as humans are and maybe better and that and can help us uh, cooperate in the future. You know, people might argue, well, humans aren't actually that great at cooperation, but we actually are as a species. I mean, some people say it's, it's the most crucial characteristics of our species is that we are super cooperators. And that, you know, if you look at civilization, uh, how, what has been collectively created by human beings, then it sure looks like we are super cooperators. And when we say that when we're disappointed with levels of cooperation, often that is because we're expecting a high level already uh, because of this uh, role as super cooperators. Yeah, that's true. And probably the scientific enterprise is like the largest in both in scale and in, in time, the largest collaboration between humans. And that has actually changed a lot of things. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, and the, you know, the publication mechanisms, for example, that have been created just to connect minds and make that a collective endeavor the institutions that we have developed in order to facilitate that. And now uh, the new dimensions of that with open source software, you know, the ability to share not just uh, papers, but also share code uh, to help people re-implement ideas and, um, and build on, on what has previously been done. It's, it's a phenomenal process of, of cooperation. Uh, the, the thing about humans not being so good at cooperation reminded me of one comment you made in one of your talks about this capture the flag AI that you developed and which then in turn, I think, yeah, human, other human players that played with that AI really made compliments about it. <laughs> about yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, that was a wonderful outcome. So yeah. originally we had started the project uh, thinking about uh, how can we, um, teach a machine to play uh, one of these games, capture the flag, you know, first person shooter type of game, but 
at heart a team game where agents want to steer the other player's flag and vice versa and work together uh, to do that. Um, so it is a team game and we train these agents in a multi-agent reinforcement learning setup. So each one of these agents is trying to um, optimize effectively the outcome for the team uh, you know, when the flag is successfully stolen, they get a reward and they try to maximize long-term reward. But they do it against each other, these two teams, and so they can, they, they always have an opponent of the opponent of the appropriate strengths to play against and, and can therefore uh, learn at that sweet spot where it's not too hard and not too difficult. And the outcome of this process of training all of these agents to learn to play that game was a, a set of agents that were pretty com competent at playing the game. But of course, we could really only determine that by letting them play with humans um, who were also good at the game. And we mixed them up, but didn't tell the human beings in the, in the trial, the human subjects, uh, when they were playing with a, a machine versus when they were playing with other humans. And we then let them fill in a, a survey um, asking them, in which games they liked their uh, their teammate uh, best and from that analysis the the statement came that people really liked playing with a machine as their teammate presumably because a they were pretty good it's always nice to have a strong teammate but also maybe because they behaved in relatively predictable patterns and you know had had a stable way of playing so that the humans uh, could in turn maybe learn to interact well with them. Yeah, that's probably a really important cornerstone of human interaction is that element of predictability of, of the other others' actions. Yeah, maybe we can move onwards here to, to AlphaGo and pick up on that note about the enthusiasm that, that games can inspire. So maybe we can really start a bit with the basics and yeah, explore why AlphaGo was such a profound step beyond what had already been achieved in, in chess with Deep Blue. Yeah. yeah, it's one of these things. I was a little surprised by the success of, of AlphaGo myself. I mean, all, all everyone on the team was. Um, because in, if you take uh, some perspective, you could argue, okay, a computer is now able to, to beat a human being at a relatively arcane board game, right? So why would that be such a big thing? And uh, it turned out to be a big thing. And um, I think the contributing factors were uh, the fact that this game is very difficult, a very difficult game to master. And, uh, you know, that there's a whole professional class of, of players who have dedicated their lives to mastering it. Um, but that is also the fact that it is um, just from the number of uh, possible combinations and games by many, many orders of magnitude more complex than chess. Um, and uh, that finally, that because of that, uh, people were not expecting that we would be able to do that at that point in time. You know, experts had predicted that it would at least be 10 more years before uh, that uh, could be tackled. And it turned out that uh, the technology at that point was uh, in a state that we were able um, to push very hard on it and, and then, uh, then in fact, uh, create a very strong Go player. And we had a phenomenal team um, of people um, um, uh, led by Dave Silver, but also with Demis Hassabis' uh, great support um, that uh, then led to, to this showdown, if you like, uh, with Issa Doll, which was certainly the most exciting episode in my research life. You know, there's, <laughs> I've never seen anything like it. Um, yeah. Yeah, so, um, I mean, just to give, give you an idea, um, the uh, why I say that Go is so difficult, um, it's mostly got to do with the fact that there are so many possible moves to choose from, maybe on average 200 moves uh, in any given situation, um, because there's this 19 by 19 board and there are 361 intersections 
and at any move a player can choose to play on any of these intersections unless it is already occupied. And so that has two consequences. One is at any move there are very many moves available that we have to choose from, many more than in chess. And also the games are much longer. They last uh, 200 up to 300 moves. And um, so that means that the object that we need to analyze in order to find a good move, what we call the game tree, is a huge beast. And um, at the end of the day, our goal is to find the best path through this game tree, where at every node, we, we can think of the edges as being the possible moves that lead to new positions, the new nodes, where then again, there are all the possible moves. And so um, people thought it was so difficult because that game tree is so large. People say, um, you know, there's as um, there's more uh, positions in the or may, more possible Go games that you can play than atoms in the known universe. But that is so correct, but also so wrong because the truth is that there are more than there are atoms if you take as many atoms. Um, as many universes as there are atoms in the known universe and take the atoms in that collection of universes. I mean, these combinatorial numbers, they're always a bit crazy, but it's really orders of magnitude bigger than, than what you think it would be. And so, yeah, the ability to, uh, to find good strategies in such a complex space of strategies, I think that that was uh, very surprising to people. Hmm. And I think, yeah, maybe to compare to chess, you also have this tree search, but it's easier to find these heuristics in chess where you can like, define what the value of certain pieces is and these kind of things. And it that was actually originally the way these chess engines were built up, uh, still built up to, to a degree. But in, in Go, you probably yeah, didn't really have any of that. Exactly, yeah. So the... Um... In chess, as you're saying, you know, where there are these heuristics for, you know, how much a queen is worth, a queen is worth nine pawns, and a knight is worth three pawns, and so on. And that gives a good basis for judging how good a position is. You can take into account uh, king safety and, and mobility, and you have a pretty good, what we call, heuristic evaluation function. In contrast, if you look at the Go board, and most people who don't play Go find that particularly obvious. It's completely unclear um, who has the advantage because it looks just like a bunch of white and black stones <laughs> sprinkled on a board. And then, of course, as you become a better player, you begin to appreciate um, the structures that they form and, and what that means about how, uh, how good the situation is for black or for white. But for many, many years, it had been um, very difficult for the computer Go community to define an evaluation function that takes a board state and spits out a number that tells you if it's more likely for black to win or for white to win in this particular situation. And of course, that was an interesting entry point because that's an unknown function, but we have data to potentially learn it. And that's where machine learning kicks in and uh, and gives the decisive advantage. Yeah. And yeah, I think one of the f uh, features you use is to actually approximate this value and network, this this function that takes a look at a position and, and finds this previously unknown distribution or this unknown value that it can assign to that position. And it Ex actually does exactly. so using convolutional networks, if I, if I remember correctly. Yeah, that's right. So, so we have um, um, two neural networks that help us out here. One we call the policy network, the other one we call the value network. And they really correspond to two types of intuitions that humans can develop about Go positions. The policy network uh, corresponds to the intuition that when a human looks at a Go board, there are certain points that jump out to them as potentially good moves, just dictated by the patterns that they see on the board. That's the same for chess also. 
Um, so humans don't actually consider all of the possible moves, but they only consider the moves that seem plausible in light of what they know about this game and the patterns they have learned through past games. And the policy network mimics exactly that. It's a function that takes a uh, board state and produces a probability distribution over the legal moves in that board state. And if that probability distribution is, re is relatively peaked on a few moves, then you can imagine that that reduces the fan out of the tree that we need to search because now we don't need to look at all the 200 moves possible here, but maybe only at 20 or 10. And so that already reduces uh, the number of nodes that we need to search. But that still leaves the problem that the game is very long. And that can be addressed by, the, by what we call the value function or the value network, which mimics the other type of intuition that humans have about such a positions or trained humans do. When they look at it, they can tell if it's better for black or better for white. And um, so this function again takes a board state and predicts um, if uh, essentially the probability for black to win in this particular um, state. And that then allows us to stop the search early, not always search to the end of the game, but look at intermediate positions and determine how good those positions are. And then now we have reduced both the width of the tree and the depth of the tree. And the remaining tree size is manageable to, to do search in. And that's basically how AlphaGo works. Yeah, I remember one comment during the documentary, I think, where you mentioned like uh, that AlphaGo, as soon as it thinks it's winning, it doesn't have to look any farther, basically, because if it's confident in that prediction, <laughs> then... <laughs> yeah, you can, uh, you know, it was, it, it was so much fun. We were, I mean, not just fun, but uh, exciting and fun. We were sitting in this control room with many, um, a bit like in the, with the moon landing, you know, with any monitor showing various states of the system. And uh, of course, the decisive one was this graph that showed the winning probability that AlphaGo itself estimated for the position as a function of time or, or of move index. And so we could see at any point in time how it was thinking it was doing. And, um, and so when that curve went up, we were happy and, you know, um, because uh, frankly, the, the go position itself was n not easy to interpret for us because we weren't, weren't that strong go players. So we had to believe the system. But of course, we also knew that if the system misinterpreted the position, it might think that it has a very high probability of winning while in fact it's losing. And, um, and that's essentially what happened in um, game four in the match when, when Isidol came up with a phenomenally creative move um, that caused AlphaGo to misinterpret the situation and then in fact um, get the evaluation wrong and starting to play uh, moves that were subpar and um, and were not adequate for for the situation, and then ended up losing. Um, and of course, that's always um, you know part of what can happen. And for us as as scientists, it was also very important because you know that's when we learned about limitations of the system. Maybe on a more personal level, how, how did it feel like to, to work under so much, like under the public eye with so many people watching? And did, was it more like a feeling of pressure or constant anxiety that it wouldn't work or like more? Positive? Yeah, I mean, there, there, there definitely was that. Um, the, there was excitement, but, you know, just if you watch the documentary, you know, the number of press that were there. And when Isidol came up, there were, you know, it was glittering everywhere because the flashes were going and um, and part of that attention also came to the team, of course. And for us as computer scientists, we tend to work more in the background than in the foreground. So that was a, a, a remarkable experience. Um, and then in addition to that, of course, there were people also uh, from Google, for example, there, um, Eric Schmidt and uh, Sergey Brin, and um, 
And so there, there was a lot of pressure and we just had to kind of stick together as a team and try to control those bits that we could control about the process and make sure again and again that everything is running in a stable way and that we've checked everything and so on. And then we really had to let go of it and just, you know, hope for the best. And, and that's what we did. So, um, yeah, fortunately, it uh, uh, AlphaGo uh, did win. And, uh, but also, fortunately, uh, we felt Isidol won one of the games because many of us in the team are game players of, of various different games. Uh, Demis himself. Uh, use, uh, is a very strong chess player, for example. Uh, we also had other uh, strong Go players on the team. And um, we had the greatest respect for Isidol as, as an opponent. You know, he's often considered the Roger Federer of, of Go. You know, he's an incredibly consistent player with a phenomenal track record of, of mastering this game. And so for us, it was the greatest honor that he agreed to play uh, against uh, AlphaGo. And, um, and it was, at the beginning, difficult for us to, to see that, uh, that AlphaGo won uh, the first few games consistently against him, because we could see that he was also suffering from that. You know, we were, of course, happy that AlphaGo was winning. But on the other hand, we saw this phenomenal master of the game suffering. And so, you know, there was almost a sense of relief and definitely a sense of happiness uh, on his behalf when uh, in the fourth um, game he he did come out the winner. And, you know, it, and you could really see that a master had found a move here that that was able to to defeat the machine that that was uh, also beautiful to to witness yeah it really adds to the emotional complexity of the whole situation that on the on the one hand we are humans and it's kind of a collective blow to our self understanding of if if we are worse at something that so seems so inherently human like playing this game that has this 3000 year old uh, tradition behind it what i also found really interesting talking about creativity and this famous move there are probably these two famous moves from these games there's move 37 by alpha go and then there's move 74 by lisa doll so there's this nice contrast between <laughs> both the machine and the human coming up with something really creative innovative yeah i agree with that and and we were also trying to give some nuance to the story i mean people think it's it's, it's person versus human versus machine but what is the machine? It's really the product of a team of humans who have worked together to create that machine and the software on that machine. And so it was really a human versus human um, more than anything else. And, uh, you know, the machine is then really just the culmination of, of the human effort in, in this realm. Yeah, but I think it's often not portrayed or like perceived that way by a lot of people. There's, I think always this subconscious or like fear of AI, and maybe there's also a reason for that. I think you are also like engaged in, for example, the partnership um, on AI, and are also doing work in trying to like, guarantee that AI is staying safe and staying interpretable. Can you maybe elaborate a little bit on on your work in this direction? Yeah, absolutely. So. Um... With great power comes great responsibility. And um, I think as we continue to develop this technology, we need to be um, conscious of, of its consequences on humans. And um, I think as engineers, we need to contribute to that. I think it's not just on us, but certainly um, we have a lot of knowledge about what's possible and we can bring that to the table. And we can also influence, of course, the uh, project choices that we make and uh, what we want to work on. And um, it's important to realize, I think, that intelligent, that AI can have all of these phenomenal benefits um in research in wider society maybe doing labor for us that that nobody wants to do um 
creating better systems that make it easier for us to interact, medical advances, making life more comfortable, maybe safer with autonomous cars and all of those things. So there's a great spectrum of things, but that there, there are also certain dangers that we need to keep in mind and, and manage. And uh, some of them we already see manifesting, there are shorter term concerns, and then there are longer term concerns uh, like AI safety, um, questions of alignment, and we can certainly talk about uh, both of these. In, in the short term, um, I think AI fairness is, is a huge topic. Um, AI systems are often automated decision systems. And when decisions are about humans, we want those decisions to be fair decisions. But how do you quantify that? There's an entirely new science emerging of how to quantify fairness in light of these AI developments and also sadly in light of failures of AI systems to display the kind of fairness that we would like to see, uh, in particular with respect to vulnerable uh, groups of people. Uh, so that's a, that's a very important area. Another one, of course, is employment. As much as the upside of AI is that um, it can do a lot of work for us that otherwise we would have to do, the transition to a world where that's the case um, is difficult because um, work and labor are the ways in which most of us uh, earn a living and um, and also, frankly, have great engagements with other people and, you know, find, find meaning in life. And um, the idea of AI replacing humans in that sense um, is dangerous because um, it might take that away from people uh, through automation. And um, we certainly want to find ways in which that is less the case or we can mitigate it and where AI plays more of a complementary role to human intelligence so that uh, these two types of intelligence can work together and um, together maybe um, you know, solve problems that individually would be hard, uh, hard to solve. There's a beautiful quote um, by Curtis Langlotz um, about radiologists. So the idea is that um, AI won't replace radiologists, but radiologists who use AI will replace radiologists who don't. <laughs> And I think that encapsulates the value of this complementarity and how AI together with a human being can lift up the whole team, so to speak, and, um, and, and make, make them um, more effective at what they do, better at what they do. Um, but it's not the case, at least in that example, that suddenly, you know, the AI doctor does everything. Um, because of these, this complementary nature of, of what machines typically are good at and what humans typically are good at. I remember in the <clears throat> initial phase after Deep Blue beat Kasparov, there was also still this idea that human beings combined with the chess engine were still better than the chess engine alone or human beings alone. So there was this, at least this, I don't know, 15 year period where that was still holding true. Where humans could still actually contribute something even though in principle the machine was better because like, they had different strengths on different aspects yeah i think that's a, that's a beautiful idea and I, I like that as well in fact the other day someone asked me if that was still the case and unfortunately i at least from my knowledge i had to say that it's not the case anymore mostly because both chess and go engines are now so far beyond human knowledge it's still true for some very specialist positions, I think. I think you can come up with chess positions that are very closed um, and in which um, you cannot reason very well about it by just expanding the game tree, but you can reason about it logically for, as a human and, and uh, come to the right conclusion. But what is nice is uh, there's a different way in which this happens now, I think, um, Coming back to the Go situation, um, the the games, the AlphaGo games, and later the Alpha AlphaZero games, which were even stronger, um, 
they have been studied by professional Go players and professional Go players have adapted their style in light of what they've learned from these these games. And so certain corner patterns, Joseki in, in Go, uh, have now been um, taken by uh, from the machine that plays them to humans. Others have been abandoned because the machine has shown that, you know, those patterns aren't actually very good. And uh, so there is this kind of interaction that humans learn more about the domain that they are interested in and that they've, in some cases, have dedicated their lives to by looking at how the machine plays and and learn from it. Yeah, it's quite interesting how it also has affected chess in a lot of ways because pretty much like currently there's this candidates tournament for the qualification for their world championship and the games usually consist of engine lines for the first 15, 20 moves, which are pretty much like humans don't think anymore, but they learn something by heart that their superior intelligence has kind of spit out and they hope to, to catch the other human mind unprepared, which doesn't have time to crown it with the engine. That's pretty interesting development, that, but still that humans kind of manage to, to keep the game interesting in, in these times. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree with that. And I mean, one thing that, uh, for example, Kasparov said about the style of, of Alpha Zero was that he felt that it was a very energetic, kind of aggressive, almost human-like style. I can't quite judge it. I'm not uh, such a good chess player, but um, apparently there was a certain engine style, um, more from traditional chess engines like Stockfish um, or Ripka, and uh, and that that was uh, felt more mechanical, so to speak, to humans. Uh, whereas um, the style that um, Alpha Zero was playing um, it seemed more open, more dynamic, and more aggressive. And I think one of the reasons is that um, Alpha Zero in its learning process was free to really weigh the different components of a chess position uh, in the way that they affect the outcome in a context dependent way. So it's not stuck with certain weights for certain pieces being on the board, but it can really look at things like um, the mobility of pieces and you know it might be down a rook, but if its but if its pieces are um, are in positions that can attack and are mobile and so on, then um, it it would give that position a high evaluation, despite the fact that it's down on material. And so it's just freer to make make these choices, and that apparently leads to this uh, very dynamic playing style. You play chess, right? Yeah, occasionally, like more as a hobby. <laughs> But I found it quite interesting how these two, like these things, intertwine, like with also new kind of playing styles emerging. And this, I think, probably the the idea, as you mentioned, that AlphaGo also because Alpha Zero, because it's self-learning, kind of gets rid of these human priors of how we would think from if you learn from expert games or if you learn from these heuristics, how we think you should think about the game but we are kind of too limited in our cultural heritage and in our limited abilities to understand that certain things, probably also like move 37 that go against some kind of rules actually makes so much sense in the long run, but we, we can't really grasp it. Yeah, exactly. Um, I, th I think it's, yeah, it's our limited capacity. We have to learn some kind of, we also need a language to talk about it, right? Uh, that's how we are taught about it. And so there need to be these concepts and their flexibility is then limited and um, thereby limits our entire view of the game. Whereas uh, Alpha Zero was unshackled and could just freely explore this space and therefore find ways of playing that would be very difficult um, for us even to understand. I think that's, uh, that's kind of interesting. Of course, in retrospect, sometimes we can understand these things but for example, in the game of Go, um, the way Alpha Zero then played at the highest level, um, for me, that was extremely difficult to understand because it was so freely floating. And, you know, sure, 50 moves later, you see how everything connects up. And, you know, that must have been the plan all along. But um, to understand it at the point of play is, is very, very difficult. 
yeah, that's <laughs> interesting that it's, it's it's showing us some kind of things that we don't even hold uh, possible anymore. Like, but the the great thing about these games is probably that it's still like in this constraint space that gives us some kind of accessibility, even though the <laughs> superhuman intelligence is is acting. I think with some yeah, and it. I, I agree. The I think it's in particular this architecture has that property because there's still the game tree. Um, one can still inspect um, the major lines that it has been considering, and so when you see a move, you can actually inspect what the principal variation is. So the one, the principal variation is the one that the system assumes would be played based on its current knowledge because it contains its best moves, but also the assumed best responses of the opponent. And so in some sense, you can think of that as a first order explanation of why a move is good. And if you then take this game tree and you're, you could then ask, yeah, but why is this the best move down here? I, I see it up to this point, but here I don't understand. Then you can, you know, look at the alternatives and how the system judge those at that point. And so you get a, almost an interactive system of explanation through the game tree, which is much more accessible, I would argue, than the weight of a neural network that makes some evaluation of some position. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, especially I guess in chess because the length of the games is usually like, or it composes more into middle game, end game, and and opening, and it's usually only like 10, 15 moves deep. You can usually follow these variations, and it, it's more like I would have never come up with that, but now that I see it, I can understand it. <laughs> it's quite entertaining sometimes, also. Agat Mator, this uh, the, the most popular chess channel on YouTube. He, he always talks about these disgusting engine lines, which is like it's it's kind of disgusting in the sense that we as humans would never come up with it, but it's kind of frustrating to us, so we have to <laughs> insult it a little bit too. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. So maybe going back to AI risks and and your work with predicting these features of personality traits from from Facebook uh, profiles. I think you actually did that work before the whole Cambridge Analytica scandal broke out and this it started playing such a big role in, in the political landscape. Maybe we can talk a little bit about what you did there and how this is relevant. Yeah, so uh, at the time we were fascinated by the idea of what uh, could be predicted from what in social media. Um, so it's clear that uh, we leave this uh, this huge trail, this huge digital trail about uh, ourselves on the internet. You know, all the decisions that we make, be that purchasing decisions, click decisions, or you know, the choice of things we like. Um, all of these things um, are collected in some form, analyzed in some form, and we were wondering what conclusions can actually be drawn from these. And um, it, we, because we were concerned, um, you know, it's very easy to give away little bits of information about yourself. Uh, but we felt that people didn't understand that all of these pieces together could give a fairly comprehensive picture of, of what a person was like, and thereby be a privacy lack. Uh, um, leak in some sense, where you know, death by a thousand cuts, so to speak, the uh, the uh, information about someone would leak out. And um, I was working with people um, at the Cam Cambridge Psychometric Center at the time, and um, they had created a, a phenomenal data set that where people had agreed to share not only personality test results that they had taken online at the site of the psychometric center, um, but also um, a snapshot of their social media data. You know, it, it was an opt-in thing, so people, uh, we didn't have that for all the test results, but um, there was a subset of it. And so that allowed us to correlate two things. We could now look at, for example, what things people liked on Facebook. It's basically a collection of pages and terms that people indicated they like. And their personality. For example, there's a big five personality um, test 
where you answer a number of questions and the system then, because it has been calibrated on, on thousands of people before, um, assigns uh, five numbers to you that represent your personality in these different um, areas. For example, um, openness is, is one of these dimensions, you know, some kind of intellectual openness um, that, that you display to new ideas. Um, another one is conscientiousness, um, those properties like that. Um, and so now we have this data set where on the one hand side we have people's uh, likes on Facebook and on the other hand we have people's personality scores. And so we tested the idea, would it be possible to predict the personality scores of people based on the things they like? And from a machine learning perspective, that's a fairly elementary process. It's really just a regression. You know, as input, you have some feature vector that represents um, the things people like. And, um, and on the other side, you have a number that you want to predict. And you know also the target number from the other part of, from the label part of the data set. And so we were able to show that it is in fact possible with uh, very few, a few dozen of these likes to make fairly accurate predictions of people's personality profiles. And, you know, if you think about it, it's maybe not that surprising. You know, is someone extroverted, for example? Yes, that might very well show up in the things they like online, the types of music they like, or the, the activities they like. Um, and um, similar for the, for the other characteristics. But we were able to quantify that and also extend it to other things like, uh, like um, IQ and uh, and other um, interesting measures. And so we wrote a paper about that, um, which we thought of as a warning because of the, this, this concern that um, people were giving away these little bits of information, but that in fact it was possible um, to assemble a, a, a fairly good picture of what they were like from that. Yeah, there's probably a contrast between intuitions of how a machine learner thinks about this as you mentioned, it's a simple regression. It's like the most obvious task you have in, in machine learning, like this most straightforward thing. And it's it, you start to build these intuitions that it's actually possible to, given a lot of small data snippets, to to come up with or let the algorithm deduce kind of correlations that wouldn't seem apparent to, to the human eye. Exactly. We were thinking of it in terms of something we called the human manifold at the time. You know, you can think of, say, the seven billion people on Earth, each one as a point in a high dimensional space. And this high dimensional space would sp be spanned by questions like, did they buy this book? Did they click on this link? Did they have this like on Facebook? Um, and so you would have this, this cloud of points, of seven billion points in this high dimensional space. And now the question is, are they randomly arranged? Or is there some manifold, some lower dimensional manifold structure in that space? And um, the intuition, of course, is that in fact there is such a manifold structure. And that means that there is mutual predictability between these dimensions. And if you have knowledge of the subset of a subset of these dimensions, you are likely to be able to predict uh, to some degree of accuracy uh, the values in the other dimensions as well. Yeah, there's now very interesting research showing that uh, the big five personality traits, especially openness and conscientiousness are correlated either to, in the American political landscape, to leaning more to the democratic side and conscientiousness more to the conservative side. And I think with the whole scandal around the 2016 election being so strongly influenced by, by Facebook advertisements and actually the ability of Facebook based on this data or the, even the public user profiles to predict the probable political leanings and of, of the of the people and precisely um, put their proper advertisements up there to to influence their decision so that it already showed that something like that can have a huge political influence yeah I, I completely agree and it's another one of those um, challenges for AI that I would list more on the short-term side actually the uh, the problems that arise from what you just explained, but also from people opting into um, certain preferences that are being presented to them. You know, the thing that we call the filter bubble, 
um, this idea that um, these machine learning based recommendation systems are so good at picking up what people like, um, but then of course reinforce what they like because they uh, they try to um, present them with more of that contact, uh, content uh, that they like uh, and can thereby have the effect of polarizing people more towards uh, the extreme ends of that spectrum. And um, I think that that is also a problem that needs to be addressed. And um, I think it can also be addressed because, you know, once we have a quantitative understanding of the effect, then we might be able to also counter it. And so that's, I think, also an important area of mitigation uh, when we think about AI risks. Do you think that has to, uh, like, the best way to counter that is on the legislative side to, to have like more data privacy laws or more the education side or the algorithmic side? I think they, they probably all need to work together um, in in order to make that work. But I mean, in general, I'm a big fan of education uh, to solve almost any problem on this planet. Um, I, I think, you know, if there is one magic wand, uh, then uh, giving more people a better education uh, is something that, that can certainly uh, uh, solve a lot of problems. <laughs> yeah, that's... Also a good reason to to appear on this podcast. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> yeah, do, right. do, do do you think that um, like as engineers of these kind of architectures, that maybe there's sometimes a certain naivety, or like it, it's hard to see all the implications of your work? I think that's also the physicists working on on nuclear fish, uh, nuclear energy, and understanding the atom didn't expect to have atomic bombs. Like being possible suddenly 20 years later. I think Otto Hahn specifically was really shocked by, by this, his discovery leading to something so horrible only in the course of 15 years. So do you think as AI researchers have the responsibility to, to be very well informed and, and think of about these implications constantly? Yeah, I think so. I think, um, AI researchers have a huge role to play there. I don't think it's right to think about them constantly. I think it's okay to think about them at points, at, at certain junction points when you think when you think about starting a new project. You know what what could be the consequences uh, when you think about um, taking new paths in an existing project. When you think about publication, you know the responsible publication is also part of uh, part of that uh, story. And um, it's partly that I think people need to think about it. It's that they probably should educate themselves, as uh, speaking of education, uh, about those consequences. But it's also working with people who, who know about this. You know, sometimes we are not the best people to to make these predictions about future consequences, but we can maybe find people who can do that. Uh, for example, at DeepMind, we have a, a cross-functional group that looks at different um, projects and, and tries to advise on, uh, on the best course of action in those uh, projects. And one thing that's important is that it's a cross-functional group that gives different perspectives. And we also speak with, uh, with ethicists who, you know, who are great at really laying out the big picture on these questions and and you know for example just making clear what is the decision space here and and what are the potential consequences and how can we weigh benefits versus risks and uh, yeah i think it's it's uh, it should be and uh, yeah it should be a big part of uh, of what we do yeah i think so as well especially because we have a hard time estimating when uh, general intelligence is coming about. Do you have any guess or like estimate? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I don't actually. But um, uh, but it is an interesting question, and it's what I find fascinating is how how pe far people differ in their assessments. I mean, I've heard from people I respect. Um, very different ranges, roughly from maybe 15 years from now to 200 years, 
you know, and those are all smart people. So uh, that makes me think that I better not um, put my head into that particular <laughs> ring. Um, but also because the, the goal line is a little fuzzy, right? I mean, what do we mean by that um, general intelligence? Um, I've seen one a survey where they did a pretty good job of um, listing things that humans can do, often professional activities, and asking more specifically about, you know, when do you think an AI will be able to do X, where X could be, you know, um, drive a taxi autonomously or um, uh, design a building or, you know, different kinds of things that humans can do. And and then you, I think you can get to better answers because now it's about concrete tasks. But then, of course, you might fall into the trap that maybe we'll have specialist AIs for all of these things at some point, but not the general AI that um, could actually do all of them. So yeah, it's it's a very tricky question, but uh, fascinating. Yeah, and this ability to generalize is like something that's so uniquely, or it seems at this point to be so uniquely human. Maybe we can quickly just mention your work on Mu Zero and like this idea of also developing these reinforcement learning systems that can generalize across different environments. Yeah, so um, out of the AlphaGo work drew, uh, grew a drive to make the system ever more general. And so, AlphaGo still required human data. You know, it was trained on human data uh, from Go games. Uh, we also designed features that we knew would be useful for the program. Um, but then we wanted to move away from that. We wanted to, um, with um, AlphaZero, to uh, get rid of the need for human data and make it purely self-play and also make the input representation not tailored towards the goal of playing Go well, but independent of that. And so we expanded to um, three board games, uh, Chess Shogi and Go, and also uh, made it purely self-training. But then that system, AlphaZero, still uh, needed knowledge of how the game actually works. You know, it needed knowledge of the game rules, how the board changes when you take a certain action and what kinds of rewards you get so on. And so the the next step that we took was then, and the most recent, was this idea of Mu Zero, which is a system that not only learns to play well, but it does so without knowledge of the rules. So it just interacts with the system and um, learns from that what the dynamics of the system are. Well, you know, for example, when you put a certain stone down in Go, that certain others are removed when there's a capture. You know, it needed to learn all that by just experiencing it from self-play. And so uh, another important thing is that we didn't give it, or another way of viewing that is we didn't give it access to the simulator to build this tree, um, but it needed to then use its internal model to do the tree search. So it's no longer, in some sense, like a human playing the variation out on the board, but it has to do it in its mind, or in this case, in a particular latent representation that it's, that it's learned through self-play. And um, that system, in fact, um, also worked uh, on Chess Shogi and Go, um, even a little bit better on Go than the previous system, interestingly. Uh, but it's inherently now also a single agent system. And so we could also apply it um, to the suite of Atari games. Um, that was an important milestone in the earlier history of DeepMind, of course, when the DQN system uh, was able to, for the first time, learn different video games across a suite of video games. And um, so Mu Zero then um, achieved state-of-the-art results in that uh, suite of games as well. And uh, what's remarkable about that is that this kind of what we call model-based reinforcement learning um, had so far not been very successful at this kind of domain. The idea of model-based reinforcement learning is that the system 
learns a model of how the environment behaves and then uses that model to plan what it wants to do in that environment. And um, that's in contrast to directly optimizing the kinds of things that you want to do in, in the given environment. And so that was an important step to show that Mu0 um, was able to do this kind of model-based reinforcement learning and in some sense, think about plans to carry out in, in its mind. Yeah, that also seems like an idea that is becoming very prominent in cognitive neuroscience with like this like this idea of latent processes being modeled inside the brain and kind of acted out internally in Carl Friston's theory, for example, those kind of things. I'm now kind of mindful of your time as well, so maybe we can move on to like more meta questions that I just wanted to ask in the Yeah, end. go for it. <laughs> just one thing that occurred to me because you are also a physicist by training and it's, it's, it's just an observation that I made a couple of times that physicists just keep up ending keep ending up in a lot of other fields and doing a lot of other things but still kind of conserve a way of thinking about the world do you, do, do you think there's anything like meaningful there or did you still think about yourself thinking as a physicist about problems yeah I think the the, the physics training um, gives physicists a certain way of thinking about problems and um, in particular I think it's uh, first principles reasoning you know going back to the very basics and trying to come up with simple models with the simplest possible model that can capture a particular phenomenon I think that's a typical physicist way of thinking um, in in, uh, in my particular case, it's uh, of course also true that I studied physics and uh, for me it was the connection through statistical physics that brought me to machine learning. Um, statistical physics uh, studies the interaction of very many molecules or atoms and looks at the uh, emergent phenomena from that. Um, for example, phase transitions and things like that. And um, it's based on the idea that there are many um, particles that all essentially are the same in, in their properties. And um, that idea was then transferred by, by others to neural networks because uh, in neural networks, the idea of that architecture is also that you have very many small constituents, namely the, the neurons or the artificial neurons that then interact together to give interesting emergent phenomena, for example, the ability to, to learn things and to generalize. And so at that point, there was a literature that applied techniques from statistical physics and had imported that to neural networks. And, um, and that's, um, that's what got me into machine learning. But there was a second dimension, uh, which I think is worth keeping in mind, which was that I felt, um, that it was difficult to uh, find good problems in physics because physics had already been so phenomenally successful in the 20th century with relativity and quantum theory and, and all the work uh, that followed that. Whereas the, the question of what is intelligence, what we started with uh, in this podcast, how does the mind work? How does the brain implement the mind? Those were questions that were wide open and frankly still are wide open um, in my books, but a little bit of progress has been made. But for me, that, um, that was then a very natural step to, to think, okay, maybe I can bring to bear the expertise that I've acquired through my studies in physics, but apply them to a field where there are still more open, exciting questions. I'm sure they exist in physics as well. It just wasn't at that time to be as obvious and kind of the bigger open questions seem to be in this realm of, of, of mind and brain. And that's why I reoriented in that direction. Yeah, I completely agree. It's, it's this, I think in particle physics, especially there's this like, exponential increase of people you need to like just chip away at, at new insights. It's, it takes like 10,000 people to find one new particle, but in, in intelligence and, and machine learning, there was a lot of, yeah, there's so many things to be understood about the brain and the mind and intelligence that it's like a more exciting 
field, also to my mind. That's why I also moved from physics to, to this field now. Uh, do you have any favorite books or like books that most influenced you, like intellectually or more, maybe on a personal level? Yeah, I uh, the book that uh, was really instrumental to getting me interested in AI was certainly Gödel Escher Bach by Douglas Hofstetter. And I think it might not now be such a fashionable book anymore. It takes a more uh, symbolic approach to AI, which um, which is the school of thought that uh, Douglas Hofstetter uh, comes from. Uh, but for me, th that book was an absolute eye opener. And it's also one of the most beautiful books that I've ever s seen uh, because it, uh, it has this connection between logic and visual art through Escher and um, music through Bach. And um, yeah, it, it, it's my long, long time favorite, although it is in some sense a little bit disconnected from what AI now looks like. And then on a more personal level, uh, I really like the book The Mind Illuminated by uh, Chula Dasa. It's, it's a meditation manual um, and it's the best written meditation manual that, that I've ever encountered. And so it's essentially an instruction manual for the human mind, I would argue. And so that certainly had a huge influence on, on my um, development um, as a meditator. Nice. Yeah, we'll definitely check that out. I haven't heard of that before. And is there any advice you would give to someone like in their, like starting out with a career in the sciences or like in general? Maybe some big lesson you learned, what you would have changed if you would still like could look back to your 20s or like get a time machine and <laughs> change something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would say um, read widely. I think um, there's, there's maybe a tendency to specialize too early nowadays. And um, I think it's great to keep an open mind and read into different fields and try to connect the dots. Um, that that is super important and um, also understanding how important it is to ask the right questions um, often you know once the question is set um, there's some path some technical path to arrive at an answer but if that question wasn't a good question to ask you can w waste a lot of time trying to answer the wrong question and if you instead focus on on finding the right question the relevant question or the question that you are in a good position to answer um and and um, only then uh, embark on answering it i think that uh, that is certainly a, a good strategy as well otherwise yeah keep an open mind and follow the evidence <laughs> yeah i think that's a beautiful note to end it on thanks a lot for this really awesome conversation had a lot of fun. Great. Thanks for having me.